Okay, so I have to wait if this works. Perfect. Okay, uh, so welcome to my talk. I'm really happy to be here uh, with all those great speakers. For me, it's the first time speaking at a conference, so um, it's a nice experience for me. And I'm happy to share my thoughts about the collaboration between uh, designers and developers during the daily work. So you might ask yourself, who is this one? Um, I might not be that famous as uh, Vitaly from Smashing or all those famous guys, but um, I want to tell you something about myself. I work as a software developer at Nemix. This is uh, a web agency, a large one, which is originally based in Switzerland and has some offices in Germany and the US as well. And we have kind of a an other approach than other agencies. We, we have all the disciplines in, in the agency. So we do design, concept work, development, front end, back end, everything, the whole package. Before I um, joined Namix, um, I did some interesting stuff in the Java area, from Java enterprise applications, client server stuff. And I went back to the web industry because, you know, I don't like Java. <laughs> Uh, so I'm more the script guy, and um, I like PHP and JavaScript and stuff like that. Um, besides my, my daily work um, of doing uh, front ends and, and back end stuff, I, I love to do my private projects. So you might have seen this one over there. That's uh, Git the simple guide. No deep shit is the, <laughs> the additional line, and it's it's a guide about Git, the version control management system. And you can see uh, that I'm, I try to be a bit passionate about design. So I want to talk about something really technical, but with a great design as well. And this one over there is uh, Eclipse Color Themes. That's a plugin for Eclipse. Who knows Eclipse? Everyone, okay. So it, it's, it's a plugin which allows you to customize the colors of your code, which is something really simple, but Eclipse doesn't allow it out of the box. So we uh, created a plugin which allows you to create your own themes. Enough about me. So my talk. First of all, I want to talk about some challenges I experienced during my work at Namix. Um, in, in large web projects. Then I want to go into deep with style guides. It's a topic currently, uh, it's currently growing. And in the end, I want to show you my vision of style guides and a demo of a tool I developed with these thoughts. Challenges. I, I was thinking about uh, my talk <laughs> for a long time, and um, I just picked some of the challenges I experienced. I, I mean, there are many, many, many ones, um, but I want to just pick some of them and just give you give you an intro, uh, so you can maybe talk a little about it after the talk with me. False assumptions. I was currently working on a project, um, a large front-end project, and I went to the designer and I showed him my, my work on the front-end. So um, I had a button with a border, and when you hover the, the button, it changes the border color. Something really simple with a, a tiny little animation in there. Like it was going from gray to dark uh, to black. And he told me, whoa, um, I didn't know that's possible. Well, now you can think, well, maybe he's a bad designer, I don't know. Hopefully not. But um, if we look at an example, like this here. Oh, go back. Maybe you have seen this one. It went over Twitter all over. Um, it's an example of scrolling effects. It's all different kinds of scrolling effects. 
with 3D transforms and stuff like that. <laughs> and this might be something a, a normal designer might not be able to know about these kind of effects. So we have to tell them or we have to learn them that there are new possibilities all the time. So it's not like one year ago I've been told that um, it's not possible to make any animations, it's just flash or something like this. So um, designers have to be, have to know what's possible and they don't have to know what's possible one year ago or two years ago. They need to know what's possible today. So they need to know about actual developments like in CSS3 or JavaScript. So in my opinion, every designer or every web designer shouldn't only know about art. Um, they should also know about just the little basics of CSS, for example. This is uh, just a short list of CSS techniques. All of, all of you know them, but many designers are not aware of them. So I think they, they don't need to code these things but they need to know what's possible. And for developers, it's the same. It's not only the designers they need to learn about new technologies and current developments. It's also the developers who should understand a little bit of design. Like uh, Denis Mishunov told in his talk, it was a fantastic talk and hopefully you got some insights there. And visit UX conferences like this one. I was last year I was in Oslo at the conference, at the front-end conference, and I learned a lot about design. I mean, I'm a, I'm a developer per definition, but for me it's really important to know about UX as well and design as well to build great products. Because without a great design, you can have a huge database with nice performance and everything, but nobody uses it. And now how to learn these things? Well, the easiest thing is to ask your team. You have the experts in your team, just ask them, talk with them about your design, about your development, and learn from them. Or you can use learning platforms. One of them is Treehouse. I, I really love Treehouse because they have such a great design. And they have a lots of hundreds of videos on there about the core basics of web design, web development, and iOS and mobile development. So as a designer, just go in here and grab an account and just learn about the basics of HTML, CSS, and all those kinds of things. So the first learning I want to tell you is don't stop to learn. So and not only learn in your area. Try to, to extend your, um, your knowledge into UX area or design areas. The second one, right time for front-end work. In our company, we, we have um, a workflow that looks pretty much like this. We have someone that creates a concept and someone starts to sketch out things, U user experience designer, for example, and we create wireframes based on those sketches, and then we start hand it over to the design team and they start creating nice uh, colorful designs. And after this is done, we have a bunch of screens, like 50 screens, 60 screens, and they get hand over to the front end development team. And then we start creating these things. And then we ask ourselves, yo, well, there is an animation missing. What happens when with the active state and what happens then, what happens in this case, what happens in this case? There is a lot missing, and that is, that's because of the missing know-how at the designer side. So I, I, I was asking myself, is there not a better way to, to do this? So we were talking about another approach. So that we have the front-end part split it up in two parts, and we try to make the front-end prototype next to the wireframes. 
so we can try out animations and stuff like that before we create the design. But I'm not a huge fan of this version. My preferred version is this one. We don't split up the front end part, we split up the design part. So we, the design team creates some moods, like two or three screens presented to the client and they approve it. And after this is done, it gets into the design production. So every sub page needs to be created, all those tables and content pages need to be done. Uh, and in, in, this, in this process, you have a lot of work to do, which is not as easy in Photoshop, but would be easy in front end. For example, a table design. In this example, for, for example, this one. This is uh, a timeline design from Dribble, really nice one. And when we want to get the real experience of what we're doing, we need to create more than just those three blocks of in the design. And it's a huge amount of time that you need if you want to create like 50 of those. But when you hand it over to the front end developer, he creates this in like, what let's say an hour or so uh, timeline, if he's fast. <laughs> and then uh, you can take this as a, as a basic for, for further developments. You can try out what happens with scrolling, what happens with um, the hover effects on those boxes. So it's much easier to try all these alternative designs and variants and interactions than, than it would be in a design. So if you change like these spacings over there, if you have other paddings you want to try out, you have to change a lot in the whole design. It's much easier to do this in front end. This is another example of a table. If you want to simulate like 100 entries in the table, it's much easier to do directly in the front end. So this is why it's important that during the production of all those different sub pages, you work together. So you save time, you can test many more approaches and you can exchange each other with the ideas. So a developer also is a creative person, I think. And so he can give insights and learnings from his side and the designer can explain what he was thinking about when designing this scene. So try to collaborate with designers more. Design deliverables. I want to show you what, what as a front-end engineer we need to, to start working on a front-end. We get some PSDs, JPEGs, PNGs. Unfortunately, we sometimes get PDFs or InDesign files or whatever funny vector file. I mean, it's, it, it's good to have a vector file as a basis, but to start front-end work, we need some pixel graphics. We need colors. So if we have a look at what I got for a project, this, this is a document I got for an actual project. It's a really easy one, but it's nice to see. So if you scroll down here a little bit, I got this PDF document with all those colors in there. That's, that's really nice because I can see it, I can use it as a reference and can start working. I don't need to go to Photoshop and pick a color. Maybe I don't pick the right pixel. and I don't have the right hex code. So this is a reference which is really helpful. And then you, you have the name of the color. I think it's way more easy to talk about colors if you have a name. So when I call my friend over there and says, hey, change the header color to 41C4FF. It's probably not that fun, but change it to baby blue, it's definitely clear. Typography. Um, it's important to know for sure font family, font style, weight, especially for web fonts. We need to 
be sure what kind of weights we need to use. The size, in pixels or EMs, color of the font decoration, and especially the line height. Sometimes designers try to design things just for one line, and um, the reality is like multiple lines. So line height is also important. And if this is not defined and you start developing things and you see, oh, these are two lines and they are just right next to each other, try to increase them by yourself. And it's a good, it's a good one to just take between 1.2 or 1.5. It's not that bad. Dimensions. Uh, as, as you've seen in this, uh, in this guide, there is also a grid in there. That's really nice, but normally the, the, this is not enough. So you get some additional measurements directly in the document, <coughs> like in here, or these spacings here. And if you have them, it's really easy to start working. You don't have to go to Photoshop, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and measure, measure, measure. It's not fun. So documentation. It, it's really important that you get a document with those screens, which includes all the important information for your work. Try to explain to your designers that this is important for you. And and if you don't get it from the designers, create something by yourself, maybe. You might not have that much time, but it's really good. And it, and it is, in addition, it's a, a, a good deliverable for your client as well. So deliver complete documentation. What we've seen in this screen, this is also called a style guide. Am I a little bit fast? <laughs> okay. So style guides. This is the definition of style guides I found in Wikipedia. Does every one of you know, uh, have you ever heard about style guides so far? Not that much. Okay, why do we need a style guide? I've explained some of, some of the issues uh, in the last slides, but it's important to have, in, in larger projects, to have like a reference, a guide. When you, when you go broad, you create many screens, you create responsive designs, and you get more colors and more colors and more colors. It's really important to have this kind of documentation. And it's a chance to define what you really need. So when, um, when a concept is created or your project manager starts off the design briefing, he can then define, I want to have all those informations in the resulting style guide. So I want to have a hover state, I want to have active state. I, I want to have all those viewports for responsive design. There are different types of style guides. The classic ones are those used like for branding, for example. So there are colors in there, brand usage, typography, dimensions, and some other nice principles. The evolution of this one is the web style guide. There are controls added, there are states added from like input elements, text areas, buttons, uh, iconography, and responsive design viewports. I have an example of from BBC. This is the web style guide from BBC. And we go down here. You have grids in there. Then you have all those measurements which are not really visible during the, with the grid alone. Yeah, and this continues and continues. Here you have all those uh, typography things, letter spacing and stuff like that. 
it's a, it's a really comprehensive example. You don't have to write all those 100 pages of Stargard. It's enough to create just one page, two page, three page. It's enough. Because someone needs to work with that. It's not, not something that gets into a folder and you take it down, they have 100 pages. No one needs that. And then the next step are front-end style guides. So it's, it's pretty much the same, but you add some markup. You add CSS and you add JavaScript. So it's way more technical, way more structured. So you add all those elements you create during the front-end development and add it to the documentation. Okay, but when I look at this, it's, I'm a developer, so I always think a little structured. So when I look at this, I see those, those hex values. I see the same hex value here and here, or I see the same like font family here, and those are the same. And these are really important informations, really interesting informations, but they're just written in a, a PDF or in a, PSD file, it's just designed, it just look nice, but I cannot do anything with it. I can read it, but I cannot extract the information of it. Now, this is why designers are thinking like colors and ooh, chaos, and uh, <laughs> we're more structured. That's not, that's not a bad thing by definition, and but it's why we look at this document like, oh, there's structured information. I need them structured in a structured way. And I want to reuse all those informations in there for my code, probably. So we think of colors. May we create a less library, for example. Um, we create less variables for all the font families and combinations. Why we write down all those things in a document which we cannot reuse, where we cannot re create something based on this. So how to add more structure to this kind of things? I don't want to talk about Bootstrap and Foundation. Many others do this. But I want to have a look at, at one part of Bootstrap, for example. And it's the base CSS. So when we have a look at base CSS from Bootstrap, You have something similar. So you have like forms, buttons, images, icons. It's really kind of a documentation. It's not really the, the, the sense of Bootstrap, but it's a nice example of what we can produce as an output from our development. And what also is interesting is that all these informations, like colors, for example, you can see in the customize tab, you're able to like fill in all those colors and create another uh, version of your bootstrap for your project. And this is like the beginning of uh, some more structure in, in style guides. So why don't we have something like this for normal style guides? But still, for front end style guides, you see that there are developers working on them. So it's highly structured. It's based on the actual CSS. It's based on the actual markup, based on the actual JavaScript. So it's, it's really structured. So this is why things like this exist. You cannot see it that good. So we go there directly on the site. Pairs, for example. This is a so-called pattern library. So when we see. We click all those elements at left side. They show like different elements of your front end and add the information of the, the markup you should use and the CSS you should use. And also you have a preview. And it's also based on actual markup and CSS. You can download this thing and use it as a WordPress theme and create it for your own project. 
Then there is something like KSS, it's Nile style sheets. This one is really interesting because it, it generates style guides based on your CSS comments. So you have a, a syntax, oh, just do that away. Uh, and with KSS, this is a guy called Nile Nice, and he is working for GitHub as a front end developer and designer. And they've created their own style guides. They've, they have been released like a few months ago. So they have the CSS style guide, where they have buttons in there, for example. And you can see all those class names over here. And this is actual CSS and actual actual code. So it's not a document just designed and created with no structure in it. Not not the content structure, but but the data structure behind it. So how do we create style guides in this? kind of way. Okay. So this is my, my own vision. I've created um, a tool called Clarify. It's like the, the, the main idea is to create style guides in an interactive way so that designers and developers can define all those informations we've seen in style guides like this one but in a way that is stored in a database and we can extract all those informations for different products, like for documents, for wiki, uh, for um, testing, for calculations and stuff like that. And now I want to yeah, give you an insight in, this, in the current developments. It's still, it's still um, like a prototype, but I want to share the development with you. So this is where you enter the, the application. And then you can see at the right side, you can see all the screens you've got from the design team. In this case, it's, it's not much, but it's the same example as we've seen in the PDF. And then you can click on those screens and you have a cipher on the left side. So you have different layers, comments, measurements, colors, and modules. And then you can, if we go to measures, you can just measure different elements. And you have a magnifier glass, which helps you to, to find the, the right pixel. It's not that easy with the trackpad. <laughs> so you're able to measure all those things you're not be able to see in a grid, for example. You can resize them afterwards. And it's been stored and everyone in the team can see the same results. Then you have colors where you can just click on a, on a color area and it generates you a name for this color. So you don't have to care about, oh, what is it? Maybe you have um, a preset from your client, but it helps you to just find funny names <laughs> for funny colors. So if we pick the color of this line, like blue Diane or whatever this is. And this, you can do this all over. And then you can see it, it's, it's added to this, uh, to this bar over there. So in your whole project, as well in the other screens, you can see those, those colors. So they're here. And then you can pick them and just drag and drop them onto a screen. So you can ensure that the color you picked on another screen is, just, is exactly the same on this screen. It might happen that designers tend to be not too consequent sometimes, and maybe in a, like, screen number 30, color blue is like a little bit different. <laughs> so um, this helps you to keep your color palette clear and, and, and safe.
And then you have the possibility to pick, uh, to create modules. So I've done this in this example, but um, I create another one. Let's go in, uh, let's have a look at this example. And this layer is for something I call analysis of, of the screens. If you begin working on the front end, you first uh, have a look at the screens and then you see, well, like you, you, you can see a structure in it and then you, you start creating modules, you start creating structuring, all those kinds of things. And this helps you to do this not on paper or somewhere, somewhere else or in Photoshop. Um, I, I personally done this in, uh, on paper before I had such a tool. So I just draw out all those rectangles and said, okay, this is logo, this is this, and this is this. But here you have the, the, the analysis of, of the, maybe the team leader uh, available for everyone in the team. So you have a larger team with five people. They can see all those modules you've defined. And after you've done, and that's the real magic, I think, you can create, oh, I forgot something, the comments layer. <laughs> um, yeah, you're able to create comments. That's a funny thing as well. But um, you can just click on, on the screen and create comments on the screen. So if you have like hidden features or if you have this, This image here, I don't know, as a front-end engineer, I don't know what exactly should happen with this visual. So I have these dots over here. I, I, I can assume that there are many of these visuals. They change, um, but how fast do they change? With which transition do they change? What happens if I click here? Does it stop after, which sec after how many seconds it starts over again? There are many, many questions that need to be answered. So the designer has the possibility to just write his thinkings just in a comment here. So uh, change image after five seconds with a dissolve effect, for example. And after you've defined all these kinds of things, you can click generate style guide. And what this does is it just adds all your information in a document. It's pretty much the same as the PDF document you've seen before, but it's not as finished for sure. But you can see a minified version of the, of the screen with all the comments on there. Scroll down and then you can see all the modules. So you have an idea of what, which module has which function. You can think about adding comments here. And then if you, if you come to the project, you, s you can have an idea of what the structure of the, the elements and the site is. And in the end, you can see all the colors with all the information you need, all the RGB values, hex values, alpha values, and names. And as you can see here, there is also the, the short name for using it in less or SES. The same thing you can see here. You have these export possibilities. You can export colors directly to less. So the color palette the designer defined for you, you can just copy paste it, use it in your project. Same for SES. And this one is also interesting. It's, it's a, a ACO, it's like a Photoshop color swatch. Um, you have all these color palettes in Photoshop. So you can just export all those colors into your <coughs> Photoshop and you have the same colors in there. And if we have a look at another example, it will be possible to do it as well with fonts, with the typo typography. And all those colors used in there are just references to the color palette. So if your color changes, everything else changes. And we are able to generate 
less templates or whatever based on this information. I think this can be a huge opportunity in the future to just structurize all these definitions and information and not to just create nice looking style guides who no one uses. I'm too fast, definitely too fast. <laughs> uh, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, final thoughts. Um, I just wanted to show you my idea of what the future might be in style guides. And hopefully you're interested in, in these kinds of developments and you can try it out on uh, Clarify IO and We'll see how what it brings, and for sure, um, yeah, my company or our company is hiring, and that's a picture of the last uh, Christmas party. Um, a really nice guys, one is over there, and uh, yeah, just come on and talk. We're always looking for great front end people. So thank you very much. It was a little short, but <laughs> hopefully it was something. So, any questions? That, that's super impressive. Very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, did you think of scraping an existing site and making a style guide out of it? Because it often happens to us just like we need in our style of that such and such site. So, what, what do you think of it? I think it's a really great idea. I'm, I was thinking about. Um, generating it from our, uh, in our project, we use an approach of creating these modules um, in HTML and CSS and JavaScript as well. So we, we currently use this technique um, in the front end as well. And with that, we are able to extract all those informations. For sure, you can just uh, like crawl all those CSS and extract the information. I'm not sure how how the quality is at the end. But it would be interesting to see <laughs> how, how clean a color palette, for example, will be for a site you crawl. It will be a nice, uh, nice experiment, for sure. No, uh, it's open source. Oh. Yeah, you can get it from GitHub. Just. Uh, get it as long as it's there. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's uh, I mean, that's not rocket science. It's, it's not that much code. It's just a little bit of PHP, MySQL, and memcache and stuff like that. And it's, it's, not, it's not based on a framework or something. You just can. But seriously, this is really awesome. And Thank I would you. love to give you money for this, but <laughs> I can't, so. <laughs> No, it's, st it's still in the very beginnings. I don't know where it's going, but um, I really like people think more about their workflow and about their techniques. And so this is an approach according to style guides, but this works in other, in other examples as well. And I'm a huge fan of tools. So I think if a tool is great, it makes people doing their work more fun, more funny. So when I ask designers about measuring things, creating style guides, they, they, they hate it. They don't really like it. They need to do it. So why not give them a tool where they can help us as developers and help themselves because it makes more fun. So this is the idea. Any other questions? Yes. Right. Is there a possibility to uh, export not only a PDF or a style guide, so to export CSS and markup files as well? Um, there is something that might be interesting for you in this case, but there is no direct way of exporting um, markup yet. But what, it ex what exists is an export for Terrific. This is um, the library we use for creating modularized front end. And we just copy this line here and it creates us all those modules in our um, terrific front end. And it really helps to kickstart things. So 
this is another interesting thing you might look at. It's, it's terrific, it's also open source, you can use it. And it has the same modular approach. So um, you've seen that, that in the style guide that I've began to integrate all those markup things as well. So my plan is to reduce our work at the end of the day. So <laughs> why, why, why writing all this stuff all the time? I don't have to, I don't, I want to concentrate on the funny things like doing nice interactions and so it's all about optimization, about, yeah, about efficiency in the end. Okay, thanks, great job. Other questions? Yeah, so thank you very much for listening and have a great conference.